Shopping in a Down the Road show. On this episode, we have our Lazy Life Lessons with Brian C. Dunn. We're going to talk about the Two Wolf story and hear the actual version of it. Then we're going to get right to Matthew Wolf. He's a fantasy writer. He's got the Ronin Saga series out right now. The first book is available on Audibles. I'm listening to it currently. Loving it so far, Matt. And then we're getting right to Lee McDermott. He is one of the fight coordinators from the show Vikings on the History Channel. I love this show. And we're going to talk about Valhalla, the spinoff coming up, and how we're not allowed to talk about it. So those of you in the business, you get it. NDAs. Here we go. We are back again with our lazy life coach, Brian C. Dunn. How are you doing today, buddy? I am doing great. How are you doing today? I am very happy to have you on today's show. We got an amazing show coming up right after you. Let's get right into it with you. Let's talk about the wolf story. Oh, absolutely. So um, there's a Cherokee wolf story. You may or may not have heard of it. And I'll just refresh everybody's memory by telling the story. And I'll keep it tight. I'll keep it tight. (laughs) So there's a grandfather, a Cherokee elder, who is teaching his grandson Um, basically the ways of being a man or being an adult, being a wise person. He says, inside of me, there are two wolves. There's a wolf that is light and good and kind and loving. And there's a wolf that is fearful and angry and aggressive. And they're at war and they're always fighting. And the grandson quizzically asks his grandfather, well, grandfather, which wolf is going to win? And so the grandfather says, the one you feed. Now, I really like that story, and it really was, it's kind of been a, um, a building block for the way that I've lived my life, feeding, feeding the good wolf. However, I just recently did some research, and that story is not exactly factual. And the story that is actually told is um, that when the grandfather answers him, grandfather, which wolf will win? The grandfather says, they both will if you feed them right. Right. And yeah, the implication is that daily when you when you feed one and you don't feed the other, that if you just give all into the the good and you ignore kind of the negative, it'll sneak up on you and it'll catch you when you're least paying attention, when you're least looking for it. Um, so when you acknowledge that there are times where you should be fearful, there are times where you need to be aggressive, when you need to protect your family and protect yourself, uh, when you need to be aware of what's going on. And when you can acknowledge those aspects of your personality in your life, then you're able to foster both in balance. Balance you're not is giving, important. Yeah, you're not giving undue attention to one or the other. Now, we want to make sure that we act in a positive, kind, giving, empathetic way. And then we want to acknowledge that there are times where I'm feeling grumpy, I'm feeling cranky, I'm feeling aggressive, I'm feeling fearful. When I can acknowledge those times and be aware of those, I can move forward. There's a a little tool that I use, and that's acknowledging the fear. And that's saying, I'm afraid that I'm not going to be a successful um, whatever. And that's okay. I'm afraid that I'm going to let the people down around me. And that's okay. And what we're doing is we're acknowledging the fear, and and that fear is okay. Not, Not the meat of it but it's okay to be afraid of those things. I'm afraid I'm not going to pass my SATs and that's okay. It's okay to be afraid you're not going to pass the SATs. My wife is prepping for the California state bar exam. Good luck. We did this. Yeah. Thank you. I will pass that along. She said, um, I had her say, I'm afraid I've wasted all this time and money and that's okay. And at first she's like, Oh, I, I said, we're just acknowledging the fear, right? Mm-hmm. That way you can so, move forward with the strength. Absolutely. And remember, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is moving forward in spite of it. So exactly. yeah. that's, that's a very important um, tool to use. So hopefully you all got something out of that. That's kind of a simple lazy life lesson for you today. And I also want, if you'll indulge me, Casey, Absolutely. I, want to, I want to encourage everybody to take the Havening Challenge. It's a challenge I've started. Um, Havening is an approach to creating new neural connections in the brain. Havening is an approach I use with my clients to eradicate trauma, anxious feelings, sadness, fear, and things like that. Doing self-havening, which if you head to the link that I'm going to get to um, Casey to put in the 
comments below because I can't remember it off the top of my head. It's um, there. It, yeah, and so, oh, wonderful. Then um, self-havening targets different neural clusters, which will release delta waves, which will send through electrochemicals, which will create new neurons and new synaptic connections and make them stronger neurons that fire together, wire together. And if you'll indulge me a little more, you want me to show people how to do it again? We did it in our last podcast that I was on, but I'm going to show you real quick. We're going to target the nerve clusters right up here, right up here with our hands. We're going to rub our face. And we're going to give ourselves affirmations. I am loved. I am giving. My life is full of abundance. Okay, that's one. The next, arms, we rub down. And it's right along the sides of the arms. My life is full of uh, prosperity and joy. And then the last one are the hands, the hand washing technique. I am loved, I am loving, I am kind, I am giving, and I'm good looking. I mean, that goes without saying, though, doesn't it? Right? Well, yeah, you are my doppelganger, so it does go without uh, yeah, saying. So, you're so my goes... doppelganger. <laughs> okay, you're older than me. I'll give it to you. Uh, so, right. so, yes, so to demonstrate, once again, for all of you at home, it goes a little bit like this. I will have a successful podcast. I will have wonderful conversations. I will have guests that I enjoy. Absolutely. And the challenge is for one minute a day to do this. I challenge you to upload at least one session, tag two friends, and just feel good. Do it through the month of February. Now, the really cool thing is that by doing this, you can create a new dynamic that can kind of allay fear and trepidation. So when you are in circumstances where you might be sword fighting, or you might be engaging in other sort of activities where you might um, need be chasing to be, down dragons and killing them. Chasing dragons, right? Then, you know, having those fears can get in your way. So a good true paladin should always self-haven. Don't you think that's a wonderful thing? Or a, or a good dwarf. That's it. Yeah. Nobody havens a dwarf. Don't. Uh, Dwarf needs food badly. Don't depend <laughs> on your wizard to get you through your D and D session. Exactly. Take care of yourself. Yeah, because he never rolls a natural twenty. <laughs> and I don't even play. I don't even play D and D very often. I think I played ten years ago for the first time, and that was the last time. But so that's so. Please share with me. Do this. Share it and feel. Just feel good. Just feel good. And uh, I, I got to thank Casey for having me on to share my lazy life lessons and this havening challenge because havening is such a phenomenal, amazing approach to healing. And if you want to know more about it, hit up my Facebook page, hit all the links are in there and uh, you'll learn more about havening. It, it is, it's life changing, life changing. And yeah, so absolutely. And since you showed it to me, I have been using it daily or trying to remember to use it daily. Uh, it, I've enjoyed it. It has definitely helped. Uh, so you too can reach out to Brian. He's not just a life coach. He's a hypnotherapist. He's a havening practitioner. Right. He can help you in ways that you haven't even thought of. Not to mention he's just full of good advice. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, 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 if you, oh, did I just uh, script the mic? Okay. If you go and opt in at the, it's coachinginlife.com. Go to the blog. It'll be there. The link is there. When you opt in, we will send you a self-havening affirmations tool, which will help you remember daily and ask you questions that will encourage your uh, self-havening process. So head on over and do that. And if you want some cool coaching, you want you know, um, kind of a self-help buffet style coaching, hit, check out Coaching in Life. There, we have a lot of fun there and we do a lot of cool things. There you go, okay. folks. So you don't have to you don't have to do this alone. There's a website. There's not just Brian, but multiple life coaches to help you with this. So get involved. Click on the link in the comments. Go subscribe. And uh, thank you, Brian. Always informative. Always positive energy. Nothing but good vibes. Congratulations to your wife. I know she's going to pass. And, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. man. And I appreciate you guys. Uh, if you have any other questions, 760-985-8270, head up to Coaching in Life, or you could get a hold of me directly, sagehypnosiscenter at gmail.com. And guys, I appreciate you watching this. Thank you so much for giving me this arena. And until we meet again, inhale relaxation, exhale tension, and be well.
We'll see you down the road, brother. All right, next on the show, I'm excited to welcome my friend, Matthew Wolf, writer extraordinaire. How you doing today, Matt? I'm doing fan-freaking-tastic. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to have you here because, uh, well, I've been playing Ninja Selfie with you at Comic-Cons forever, but that's not the reason I'm excited to have you here because, <laughs> because, uh, because of my nerve damage, I haven't been able to read books, but I just got audibles. And guess what's the first book I downloaded to listen to is? Me. I feel honored. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm enjoying it already, man. A Knife's Edge. So let's, let's get out there and tell everybody about what the Ronin Saga is. Yeah. So it's the uh, first book of the series is called The Knife's Edge. It is a higher epic fantasy. The whole series is called The Ronin Saga. R-O-N-I-N-S-A-G-A. Um... It is your classic magic, dragons, elves, um, high fantasy, its own world, its own magic system, and languages. Um, kind of meets these knights of the round table characters. I've been saying this for a long time, but uh, the knights really are the heart of the story. They're these nine warriors that wield elemental powers of wind and water and fire and stone and uh, flesh and metal. It always kind of gets people, kind of a twist on the traditional elements. Which and I they, found interesting, yeah. Right, unique take, and uh, these nine knights have just always been this 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 fable that's kind of hung and clung to the land, clawing on people's minds the idea of these nine warriors that guard the world. Uh, they run out of water, guard the city of water, fire for fire, and uh, now in Gray's age, he's the main character. He's eighteen. He's the one on the cover, the facing off against the dragon. They're just a myth, just a boogeyman tale. Uh, these heroes that guard the world, and now according to legends, almost destroyed it. So now Gray finds out in the first book that uh, that may not be the case. A myth and stories uh, may have their, their root in real life. They may be, they're coming back. And now he finds out he has a connection to them uh, that, that is terrifying and exciting. And how exciting is it to finally have the first book of your chapter or your saga, your series, finally on Audible's? Oh my God, it's overwhelming. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like you think you go through the first, the struggle of book one being released and the highs and the lows of like all the reviews and the buying and like reloading the page and then it's just all over again. Uh, so it's, it's amazing. A whole new ball of uh, stress and excitement. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, 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 the guy, and the guy reading the book, man, his voice is so awesome. Yeah, I I blown away. So lucky to have him, Tim Gerard Reynolds. Uh, he did. Um, yeah, I could listen to him narrate the back of a cereal box. It's just he's just amazing. <laughs> right. I, I love it. He so he was the one. Uh, so about two years ago, I was listening to some other audiobooks by um, some other authors like Michael J. Sullivan, some other Red Rising, and he does the narration on those. He also did. Um, um, Oh, it's just, it's a Netflix. Um, I'll remember in a second. It's a pretty popular show with these women in red cloaks and all that stuff. Uh, Handmaid's Tale. So he oh. also did a Handmaid's Tale. Okay. So that's a familiar voice for people out there. Yeah. Yeah. So he's pretty popular. So I've always liked him. Uh, I, I thought he was kind of niche at first and now he's gotten like, you know, 30 bestsellers and things under his, um, but I was always like, if I want the audio, if I want the knife edge to be done, it's kind of like people always ask you, like, well, who do you imagine as the characters uh, in the movie or in the TV series? You know, right, right, crop. right, yeah. Well, before that, even me, I was like, well, who do I imagine bring it to life in audio version? Uh, and it was always Tim. But I always was like, nah, that's that's a pipe dream, and I don't know, and he's you know he's he's too cool. And so, uh, so when I reached out to record in books and was like. Um, and they're like, yeah, we'd love, we'd love to produce your thing. And uh, who would you like? And I was like, well, and, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys have Tim on your staff. And so uh, sure enough, they're like, yeah, we do. Uh, but he likes to vet his projects. Ooh. So, yeah. So he said yes to you. So he said yes. I had to. Yeah, exactly. You had to court him. I did. I did. I sent cookies. and Yeah. Uh, wow, so that's said, awesome. So yeah, so right right there, that just shows everybody. It's like, you know, you're dreaming big, but you got to go. You can't get that dream unless you actually go after it. Exactly. Exactly. You got to put yourself on the line and kind of scarily. Like, it's funny what your mind says isn't an option sometimes. And, you know, uh, you're just like, oh, yeah, I'm like, that's Tim. Tim does other really great books. But uh, like, I don't know. Dude, like, I, I want the knife's edge to be up there. 
And then when he sent back, he the first thing he said back was, um, I'm excited to wield the sword of the Ronin. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, using your own words yeah and i was like that's the nerdiest coolest thing anyone could ever say <laughs> that's awesome yeah. so 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 do you have him on you have him for the whole series then the whole series um, oh. from, from, from a to z oh sweet i'm excited see now because i haven't bought your books yet see now i get to go back to buy them as a collection for uh. myself and get them all signed by you and everything i've just been You've been wondering why I haven't been buying them all these years. I've just literally been waiting, waiting for Audible. Waiting for this perfect moment. Well, the best thing is now that you have them. Now you're like, the problems. I don't think you're going to want to, the hard copies and all that stuff. People are reading them and they're loving, they're listening to the audiobook too. But it's so funny because um, when you hear the voices, they become that character. Like now you hear book two, he's going to be Darius and Murrah and Gray. I think it's going to be so hard for people to like, for me, it's actually hard to read a book after I listen to it. Cause I'm like, I, I just like, I hear that guy's head. I just wanted to listen to him bring it to life. So, right, and other people right. have been having the, the inverse problem where they're like, they're really enjoying listening to it. And they're crushing the audio book. Um, but yeah, it is a little interesting. Some are like, Oh man, like, but Darius is a little more like this. And so, uh, yeah, uh, well, and then that's what makes people like hardcore readers is because they hear the voices and the yes. vernacular in their uh, in their heads. This is just something I was discussing with a uh, someone writing a screenplay uh, the other day about you know finding the vernacular and finding the voice for each character, and that's what makes it difficult when you're doing a, a group writing session, especially for like a film, because uh, sometimes the vernacular and the voice of a specific character changes according to who's writing it, and then you got to go back and look through the entire script you don't have that problem i don't i luckily don't have that problem but it is cool because a lot of people will tell me they're like well i'm never uh they'll listen to it and um it's just like a different it's just a different medium you know like everyone loves harry potter the books but everyone a lot of people you know love the movies obviously and so it's just kind of different a lot of people get to like have read it uh and now they get to listen to it so it's just it's cool to get kind of all perspectives right and, and very true and like Okay, like I haven't even read the book I bought and got signed uh, by Carrie Ewis from The Princess Bride about the making yes. of The Princess Bride. It's all his stories from the making of it. And the whole reason I haven't even read the book is because uh, my buddy Bernie Bregman puts on a Nerds Like Us thing where they uh, rent out a theater and they play classic movies and he brings someone to, you know, talk about it, do a Q&A before and then do, you know, like an autograph session. And so... Princess Bride was the movie, and Carrie came out to promote the book. Well, during the Q and A, they started talking about the book on audio, and uh -huh. just and how such an interactive experience it was compared to the book. And the but the, and the reason why is because like all the actors that are still alive came and read their parts for the audio book. That's awesome. And what makes it even extra special as a huge Princess Bride lover is because, you know, since Andre the Giant is dead, every time anyone read a quote or something about Andre the Giant, they all did their own personal imitation of Andre the Giant, which was just slightly nah. different. It was just hilarious and just made the audiobook that much better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that, that extra perspective, that extra layer, that extra uniqueness that you're not going to get uh, any anywhere else, you know, and uh, that just creates another layer to the world that you already love. So. Yeah, exactly. And and that's what's fun about the world we're living in now in 2020 with so many different options to enjoy different mediums of entertainment. Oh, exactly. lost, lost you. Lost you. Uh-oh. I don't know what happened. I'm Oh, it I guess I didn't I need to be fancier with my um you know, touch the screen or something. I think it, I think it was like, "Oh, are you going silent?" No, nope, I'm here. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> the people want to see you. So, yes. Okay, so as a writer and a lover of fantasy, what is it like you're watching on TV or movies that you're just really nerding out about and that you're just loving or some, or a book you're reading yourself? Uh, that's a really good question. I love, I mean, I'm pretty much anything that has some knights and swords and, and some medieval worlds. Um, of course, Witcher lately, uh, I was like, I was like, I was waiting to, to, to watch it because I was like, you know, one season, all that kind of stuff. And I kind of always view like something that I know I'm going to like because I play the video games that I kind of view, view it like a treat. Like, I'm like, oh, you know, like, when do I deserve to have this ice cream? You know? <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but I crushed that and I loved it. Um, you know, I, there's always things that you like, oh, I wish I could have seen this or that. Uh, but I think um, 
I think Jarrell was done amazing and it was, it was, it was immersive and the, the toss a coin to your witcher is stuck in my head for the rest of my life now. <laughs> and, oh yeah. Uh, All the toss a coin off the witcher's bum memes yeah. are freaking hilarious too. <laughs> like, uh, and, and, and just to follow up on what you're saying, I deserve ice cream every day, but yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the witcher was, the witcher was amazing. And what I loved about it visually, and I was talking about this with another friend, in the same podcast uh, is that what they did visually with the different timelines is they didn't, they didn't do like a separate filter per timeline. So you know what's going on. So it, once you realize it's separate timelines, it's like, crap, I'm going to have to go back and watch all this again. Yeah. Yeah. It does have that, that rewatchability, um, which is funny. Certain things don't have that, you know, Game of Thrones killed the rewatchability after the, the last season. But so <laughs> it's, definitely, it's not to throw, throw a bomb. But yeah, there's uh, there's some rewatchability. It's visually it's stunning. I think it 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 has the potential to you could kind of say one way or the other with like the different timelines. It could have been clear with it to have reader watchers who are watching it, you know, like not as like astutely or people who are new to fantasy or new or like can't. But also in some ways, it's kind of like it shows that level of like a little bit of work on the on the um, the audience's part. I think some people are like, oh, I'm oh oh okay, I see it's all tying together. Yeah, um, and, and that's what I, I, lo I love, a good thinker. Make me, make me think as an audience member. I mean, rule number one, entertain me. I got to be entertained. And if you can make me think in the process, that's yeah. an extra bonus. Yeah, 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 and it was great. And there's so many little, like, things that I love. I mean, I always love um, kind of the, the stoic character playing off with the, the goofy, uh, charismatic, like, you know, uh, oddball. So him and... Uh, who would, you, who would you be in The Witcher? Because, like, as much as I would like to think, you know, I'm a badass and I'd yeah, be The Witcher, yeah, I'd more likely be The Bard. You'd, yeah, you'd probably be The Bard. Uh, I don't think I'd be either. I feel like... Um, in the world of fantasy, what are you? In the world of fantasy, I'm great. Just kidding. Uh, I'm uh, <laughs> just pitching. Um, in the world of fantasy, I'm probably, I'm probably a mixture of both. I probably, like, want to be the guy who... I'm probably, like like two away from the guy who's in charge and badass and like slaying the big monsters. Uh, I'm the guy who's like trying to hopefully one day get to that point, but I'm mostly making too busy making jokes on the side. I'm too busy. <laughs> I'm neither, I'm neither the expert bar nor the, uh, the expert fighter. I'm, I'm somewhere in between like tossing between two worlds. So <laughs> in that case, I would be the mediocre fighter that's singing my own praises. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, anything else you're watching? You excited for Picard or anything coming out or anything coming out in the movies like this year? Um, some, I mean, some good stuff coming out. You excited? There's a lot. You excited for the new Matrix and another John Wick? Bill and Ted's Excellent Three? I mean, what? What's up? What's on your radar? I mean, all that stuff sounds amazing. I love John Wick. I love. I love action. Anything action. Uh, I think Keanu Reeves is just kind of. He's in his prime right now. He's just. He's just adorable. He's the internet sweetheart, and I. I I'm. I'm on that train. Um, yeah, put me on the put me on the Keanu bandwagon for sure. For sure, Matrix I loved growing. Up. I mean, like I remember walking out of movie theaters when I was fourteen or fifteen and just like trying to pantomime the moves, you know, <laughs> yeah. when, like, you know. So I'm 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 on all of those trains. Um, I think I crashed my bike trying to do that on my bike at one point. Yeah, did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. So and like I love Star Trek too. I've never been like. I watched um, the Next Generation and and uh, making it so, but I, I um I, I feel like my my yeah my go to is always always high fantasy like so I'm I'm always if it shows up on my radar I will love to, and I you can't not love uh, love I I think I think as soon as uh, <laughs> did you ever see every time I think of um, uh, both Ian McKellen and uh patrick stewart i think of those those like i, I don't think they were on funny or die but they were like the um they were the skits where he's talking with um uh oh, who's the actor who's the creator of the the he just did it, the gold globes ricky gervais he's okay. like they're having it's like a skit with uh ian mckellen and patrick stewart talking with ricky gervais and uh i just I've always loved them in their in, in, in all capacities as John Luke Picard, but as soon as I saw them in these like funny skits, uh, anyway, this is I'm totally gonna I'm, I'm gonna ha I'm gonna have to go look gonna, for those because the you're two gonna of, have to look them up. Well, the so, two yeah. of them together like are the best friends on the planet, and like uh, I mean, he just 
uh, proposed to Patrick Stewart the other day on a red carpet and, and just as a joke because like yeah. their friendship is that close. Like they it's kiss that in, close. Yeah, they kiss in public and say goodbye and say yeah. I love you as yeah. platonic best friends. Like I love it. More men need that kind of grown up relationship with another man, that's, quite frankly. That's yeah. that's friendship relationship goals in in in, in years in now and years to come. That I I love their relationship. So yeah, I would I'd watch anything. Same thing like Tim Rudder, I'd read the back of a, a cereal box, I'd watch anything by Patrick Stewart and, and Sarah Mune Kellen. But um let's see, what else is really good? I've been I've been kind of on reading some random fantasies. Um I've been I've been really there's there's this one that I called um so I've been going back to my classics. I read obviously anything by Brandon Sanderson. Um I finished I just finished the third book in his Stormlight Archives, uh, which is really good. I think they're they're all like twelve hundred pages, so you have to be ready to uh basically read six tomes combined to one. But they're good. Uh the world building is amazing. Um Yeah, so yeah, stuff. when you love that kind of stuff, that that's your go to. For sure. Yeah, yeah, that's my go-to. That's my 100% go-to. But I love all things fantasy and all things, you know, pop culture. I'm even Marvel, all that. Um, but yeah, so The Witch was the last thing I read. This was current uh, or watched. And then... Well, let's, really just... let's get into Marvel real quick. Because, like, now yeah. that they've wrapped up that, like, 10, 11 year span of superhero males, we're about to go into the world of super females. Like a lot yeah. of people, a lot of people are really upset about that, like and calling it uh, appropriation and overly PC and uh, you know what? Shut up, fanboys. How do you guys feel about it? As far as I feel, I feel like any good contest, like people, there's someone who said something recently that I think it was the Ricky Gervais and some of the stuff that they were talking about, like how Marvel is not, uh, and those movies aren't really movies that they're just like. I forgot how they they equated it to. They're like there's just like. Um, You're talking about Scorsese. Yeah. Was it Scorsese? Was it the was, whole Scorsese thing? It, yeah, the whole Scorsese thing saying that they're not really movies. They're not actual film. He's a filmmaker. They're just fluff. Yeah, is that what they're, they're calling? Because I don't even know how they're trying to mental gymnastics to say they're not. Um, yeah, and then even it was it was one of the characters who's on. Um, man, I think he's, he, he's, he's, he's an Iron Man. I think he's one of the main characters. I forgot what his... Um, what's i think he wears one of the suits but i can't remember because this is not i'm like marvel to like you know i know it as well as you know my mom knows it probably but um that you're no, talking about uh, war machine i think it's a war machine yeah yeah so he was talking about he's was, he was mentioning and i saw him in, in an interview and he's saying he's like at the end of the day he's like i i'm an actor and i love to play these roles but i become less of myself and i become more war machine everyone likes war machine and not me and uh, everyone likes Iron Man and not, uh, you know, actually Robert Downey Jr. And so it becomes less about the act. And I was like, well, you're playing a character anyway. Like, and any character you would play would become the character. If you're Scarface, you're Scarface, you know? Like, right, you're Scarface forever. Yeah, that's the point of the character. The point, the point isn't to be an actor. The point is that, you know, and you're not known, you know, like you're great at that character you're a great actor to play that character. So you're playing. So I didn't, I didn't really understand his point. Um, I think that a movie is a movie. And I think you said it best in the beginning that entertainment is the, is, is the name of the game that you are, you are lulling someone into a world. You are trying to make them forget where they are in that moment, breaking completely lulling them into the dream and losing themselves. And when they walk out of that world, they, they have to be like, Oh yeah, I'm back. I'm back in real life. Yeah. That's the and and that, and that is the purpose of all entertainment. I mean, look at sports. Sports is the original entertainment, and it's to give us something to look forward to, to forget about our BS and our stress yeah. and our anxiety and our own lives, so that we could submerge ourselves and be completely submersive in another world and yeah. uh, live out fantasies, whether it's in the fantasy, sci-fi, or you know whatever arena. Exactly, and in all those cases, it's it's not even cheap. Like marvel and things like that and there, there's been a many times where there is a catharsis there's an emotional release you know i want to get back to like you know plato and aristotle like i there are moments in those scenes where I'm, man like it's tear jerking and heart jerking and that, there's nothing about that um just because there's action and grand heroes and there's characters that are you know have you know ex extraterrestrial powers that is still awesome they make you feel things yeah well um, and and, and at the bottom of all of it, Marvel, no matter what, is still the humanity story. Like, you know, they're, yeah. they may be superheroes and they 
have these awesome experiences and whatnot, but they're still dealing with their humanity and their emotions and uh, yeah. what what's worth the their sacrifice to save the worlds they love. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I, I so I think it's I think it's just gimmicks when people come in the trash talking. I think a character is a character, no matter what scenario. I mean, sometimes people like I mean, we could go to the nth degree and talk about people trash talking. You know, um, genres that aren't. I mean, you could just keep taking this further and further away. You're like, oh, anything that's not real life, you know, or fiction or even fantasy. And people are like, you know, well, you write fantasy. Right. At the end of the day, like, characters are characters. We relate to these characters, whether they have, you know, the Wheel of Power of Winds or they're, you know, Joe Smith because of how, of their emotions, of their, of the, the, the complexities they go through, you know, losing a friend or, uh, rising up to a, a challenge that they don't think they can. Like these are just, these are universal. These are so, everyday stories as old as humanity. Yeah, exactly. You just throw some fireballs in there because it's awesome too. So, you know, can't go wrong with that. Well, let's throw some fireballs at Matt Wolf, everybody. Where can they uh, find you on social media and your website so that they can follow you and they can download the Audible and find you at a Comic-Con to get your autograph and buy your book in person? Well, every single what you type in Ronin Saga on uh, the interwebs, and you'll find all the good stuff. I'm doing two things. The Audible just came out. So if you type in Knife's Edge and go on Amazon, you can find you can buy it on Amazon or Audible. Um, I also have a link on um, my social media on Instagram. If you go through that link, um, which is Instagram, which is uh, wolf underscore writer. If you find me on there, then you automatically get... Uh, $30 on my website, which is kind of cool, just so you can get the books and kind of get kind of win-win thing. Um, but RoninSaga.com is always great. Uh, so basically any way you can find me. And then we're also just came out with, uh, so I've been, I've been promoting it, a uh, little shameless plug, but my Patreon's been pretty fun. So I've been uh, getting more people in there. We're just releasing a new video now to give people kind of new content. I mean, so we have this, uh, one of our tiers is where you can actually get um, free first editions for life. So that's been pretty cool. Um, it is cool that's a good idea yeah. i don't know yeah. any other writers doing that yeah it's pretty cool people are pretty stoked on that so yeah whether it's a novella that just comes out anything that comes out um you get kind of do the first one to get it and and forever wow so, that's cool so join the matthew wolf club i mean you yeah. know i'm not paying my membership but i am a member card carrying member, member. <laughs> yes you are you are ninja selfies for life that's right so in order to do a ninja selfie at a Comic-Con, people, this is how you do it. Sneak up on someone you know, take a selfie with them in the background, and then tag them on your favorite social media and watch their reactions when they didn't see you doing it. I've been doing this with Matt for years. It's, it's one of my favorite things. I'm always like, huh, there's this photo. It's getting a lot of likes. Oh, it's, I'm in it. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> when did he come by my booth and not even say hi? I'm a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so follow me, Wolf. Check him out at a Comic-Con near you where you can pick up a book in person, get it autographed, and get something a little personal written in there for you because uh, I am on the knife's edge waiting for more of the Ronin Saga. So we will see you somewhere down the road, my friend. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it so much. All right. I'm very excited to introduce my next guest today. His name is Lee McDermott. How are you doing today, Lee? I'm good, Ken. How are you? Thanks for having me on. This is a real pleasure. Nice to uh, see you. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's very nice to see you. The pleasure's all mine. Uh, we met back at Skyloft. I had the pleasure of serving you and your fiance. You're now right. married. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a three-year anniversary next week. It's crazy how time flies. Yeah, yeah, that is crazy because yeah. that, mean, that means we met just barely like a little over three years ago. So. Yeah. But one of the reasons I want to have you on the show today is because uh, you're a director, you're a fight coordinator, a stunt actor. Man, you do so much uh, in the industry, but you're currently coming off of one of my favorite shows for years on History Channel, Vikings. Let's talk yeah. about that. How much fun has that been to work on? It's been amazing. I mean, I started on season two. I wasn't there from the very, very start, but I came on board on season two and worked all the way through from season two to season six. And um, during that process, you know, I got brought out of the core team and I was um, put in charge of training the actors, getting them ready for their, their fight sequences, you know, working with other core stunt guys, you know, that are, that are amazing, they're awesome. But we worked under a really amazing coordinator called Richard Ryan. You know, Richard's known for doing um, 
Troy. He trained Brad Pitt for Troy. So his attention to detail in fights is like something I've never seen before, experienced. And I learned so much working, you know, under him um, because he's a very, very hard taskmaster and he brings it the best in everybody. So it was a very steep learning curve initially. And then I just ran with it. And, you know, after a while, it put me in charge of getting the actors ready because of my history of teaching and training and doing all my things. So it kind of was a really nice match that um, came together once he stepped up and he was then coordinating the whole show. So he needed some help. So um, I was the guy. So it was kind of cool. Yeah, and we were talking the other week about uh, what goes behind you getting all these actors ready for their individual scenes, let alone a big battle scene. And I think the general public has no idea how much work goes into just a five-minute fight scene on Vikings. So tell me, let's get back into that conversation that we were doing uh, in our messenger on Facebook uh, sure. about about how much time it took to get Lagatha ready for that fight scene with that big Viking and how many shots it took and how long it took to direct. All that stuff you were telling me before. Let's tell them. I mean, essentially what happened was is we, we got the script and, and you know, Catherine, Catherine's character, uh, Lagatha, she had this epic fight with this Viking white hair. You know, who's a key one, a lovely, sweet actor. I mean, he's he's such a nice guy. He's a big teddy bear. You know, that's you awesome. Know? Yeah, that's good to hear. Um, and then obviously Catherine had been used to doing fights on the show before, but she'd never done a one-on-one -on -one with another actor. It always been against other um, stunt performers. You know, right? So yeah. From the middle of battles, it was always hard in the middle of you know achieving her objective in that particular battle, that scene, whatever it happened to be. So this was an opportunity, and the way Michael Hurst wrote it, he wrote it as this big, epic, one-on-one, -on -one, massive thing. And there was a whole story that had to be woven. There was dialogue that had to be woven through the whole fight sequence. So the fight had to tell a story. So, you know, we got the, we got the scripts, and, you know, Richard and I looked at it and broke it down. We had a lot of discussions, and there was a lot of stuff, a, a lot of work, and sleepless nights went behind just the concept of the fight and trying to get it the beats to work and to get it to match with the with, the, with the, the, the story and the choreography and to really make it tell that story because you have Lagatha who was this massive um, character and story and, and she was this, you know, the, the best shield maiden that ever lived, blah, blah, blah. But then you have this Viking who is a big six foot four, massive Viking. He's, Formidable. He, he, he's no slouch, you know? And then you have Lagatha. So well, how is Lagatha going to beat him and make it believable? And that really wasn't told through the story. There was more the, the, the character beats were more of what she wanted to say to him, what she wanted to get across to him, talking about Bjorn and what happened and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, we kind of took a, a, a book out of Muhammad Ali, George Foreman. Oh. rope dope That was the plan. Let's have brought Lagatha rope dope this guy, and tire him out. You know, because she's smaller, she's lighter, she's faster, but she's not as strong. She cannot take one direct hit from this guy. She'll be done. Right. Real, real, real quick, for our, my audience is real young, that's a uh, Muhammad Ali reference. Rope a dope was how he would win most of his fights. He would let the other guy get tired by letting him swing and swing and swing and swing, and then he'd go in and knock him the fuck out. Anyway, back to your story. Right. Yeah, I'm showing my age now. <laughs> we both are. Yep. But, um, so that was, so that was, that was the plan. So, you know, we then. It took six and a half, almost seven weeks to get the fight ready to where we could show it to the director and get it approved. Because the normal process is we'll, we'll do a fight, we'll, we'll, we'll do the concept, do the script breakdown, we will you know, all work on it, get it ready, everyone's you know, working to make it what we think it should be. And then once we have it locked down, we'll shoot a previs of it, you know, and then we'll, we'll show it to the director, or the director will come to the rehearsal space and look at it, and then he'll give his notes on what he would rather see and change some things. Because obviously it's He's the, he's the main boss, so, you know, the things he likes, he's like, great, keep that, I would rather see this, I would rather see that, so then we adjust the problem to him. Once he says green light, that's it, we're good. The fight is locked, and that's the fight. And, wow. then, we, and then we show it to the actor. So the actor comes in, and then we have the stunt performers who've been rehearsing the fight, perform the fight for the stunt, uh, for the actor. They see it for the first time, and then they realize, oh shit, there's some work to be done. Right. Because so at this point, at this point, their stunt double would have already known their part, right? Yes, yes, because we had a stunt double for Catherine, even though we never used the stunt double to shoot, you know, because Catherine's off doing um, other, um, you know, she's acting, she's doing other stuff in the show. So we need someone to play her part, part of the stunt team, so that we can actually flesh out the fight and make it work. And sometimes I've done it. I've been 
that person, you know, because we're not going on camera, we're just, you know, playing loose. But we had some, you know, a couple of really talented um, you know, um, female stunt performers there um, that were physically, you know, very similar to Catherine. So we, we had one of those girls learn the fight completely. Yeah, because um, you guys got to mark up the scenes. The director, you know, you guys got to have cameras ready and right. lighting and all yeah. of all the special effects, not just what the stunt people are doing. There's a lot to go into this. Right. And, then, and we have to show the camera guys, we have to walk it through for them. They have to see the angles that they want need to be at to catch the fight and catch the best angles. And that's another thing is we, we know we talked to the, the camera department and some great camera operators on Vikings and great PPs. And, you know, they're very trusting. Just like, okay, guys, show us what you got. We'll show them what we have and they'll just find their angles and figure it out. And then, okay, it's, it's, it's funny because we've, we've worked together for so many years now. It's a family, so we trust each other. So, like, you know, like Kenny, one of the, the, the camera operators, he'll be like, all right, guys, show us what you've got. Fantastic. I'll find my spot. Boom. And, and he knows where he knows where he needs to be once he sees what we've done. And it just kind of blends together because we've done it so many times together and there's a lot of trust involved. He trusts us. We trust them most of the time. You know, sometimes we have to go, hey, you might want to, you know, tweak it here a little bit. But overall, it's, it's, it's a very smooth process because of the amount of, time we've spent together going through this it's, a, it's like a it's like a supermarket for fights honestly i mean yeah. you know there's there's been times when we've done not to get off the the lag of the fight but there have been times when we'd shoot one battle sequence we'd have 15 hero character fights to shoot in that one battle we've prepped those we'll finish shooting on the friday we'll have saturday sunday off we will do another we did another 12 fights on the monday like full on hero fights we conceptualized and put together 12 other fights on the Monday, wow. got, them approved, got them approved on the Tuesday, started teaching to the actors on the Wednesday, started filming them on the following Monday. Good Lord. So, that's, a, that's a schedule right there. That's insane. So that's the kind of thing that, you know, sometimes you have more time than others. Sometimes we have, like, for the, the Lagatha fight, we had six weeks to, to prepare. Then I had six and a half-ish. Then we had about six and a half, seven weeks to teach it. So we had loads of time because we had loads of forewarning. But other times, because of the schedule, like I say, it's a conveyor belt of, of script and action come towards you. So you can only prep the actors for one, what's coming directly at them. So we may be trying to prep for three or four battles ahead, mm. but we can't show it to them yet because they're only focused on what they have to do that's, that's coming right in front of them because right. that's what works. Yeah, so action we, lines, they got a, they got a lot yeah. to deal with, yeah. Yeah, so they're not thinking about next week or tomorrow, they're thinking about right now. And right. that's what focuses on so we'll get that done and that was similar to Catherine when Catherine came in um, because she'd been used to the kind of fights she'd, been, she'd done before which was still great and technical and she had a lot to do um, this was a different beast entirely because there was dialogue because there was story because it was it was all about her this was Lagatha's last hurrah yeah you know? yeah and it was this, a great send-off this, this was her last hurrah this was her one-on-one -on -one to show really show what she what she was all about and so when she came in, she saw it. She actually had vacation plans, and she cancelled her vacation plans. She was like, "Yeah, I got to get to work." You know? Okay. And yeah. But she did. I, I got to give her ten out of ten. She she buckled. She was like, "Okay, I got some work to do." And she came in. She trusted me, and um, you know, we, I I basically beat her around the rehearsal chair with a big stick for seven weeks, you know, and 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 worked her and. She showed up and she trained hard and she really committed to it. And it shows in the in, in the last in the fight. I mean, it really shows how she, how it came off. And I was really proud of her. You know, she did a, she did a fantastic job. But like I said, it took. So what we did is we we taught Catherine half of the fight with Whitehair's double, and then we taught Whitehair his half of the fight with Catherine's double. So they didn't learn it together. Because again, that's another thing you learn. You you bring an actor in, you bring the actor in, and you work with them then you work with the other actor. And then once they both know it, then you bring them together and they walk it through together. So it's like you learn your half of the dance in private, you learn your half of the dance in private. Once you guys know the dance, then we'll bring you guys together. And then you can figure out the details of the dance together because they are, even though we have great stunt doubles, everybody moves a little differently. So the slight differences in height, slight differences in reach, slight differences in timing, footwork, all these things are slightly different, even though the moves are the same. Individually, we always perform a little different. So that gives them time to come together and work out the nuances on their own. And then they get to discuss character development. They get to discuss how they develop the political lines. They get to figure out all that positioning. And then we go from there to, you know, when we get to the set, then we start walking through on set. And then we start looking at, okay, where are we at? There's a shed there. There's some goats over here. 
there's a horse there. There's so so then we have to start to either move the set to fit the fight or move the fight to fit the set. And then we've got to look at all that sort of stuff. But that fight had over 300 sections to it. Wow. You know? uh, and it had, um, each section had maybe between five and eight different mini beats in it. So there was a lot of stuff to learn. And so what we did is we broke it down <clears throat> in, in small chunks, you know, and I named the chunks so that I, I, I named it. It was like the, and I, I'll be deadly serious here because what I'll do is I'll, I'll write out the fight. I'll have the fight written out what it is so i'll have it in, in manuscript form almost so i so that's the fight on paper and then what i'll do i'll start taking chunks of that fight then i'll start naming those sections so that let's say you get lost you you miss a move i'll and, and this is a genuinely one of the names i used i'll say hulk smash because okay. hulk, hulk smash was a, the, the section of the fight started from when the character comes up with both axes and smashes down like the hulk so that triggers the memory in the actor Instead of saying, oh, you know the bit where you come up and do the blah, 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 blah? No. Sections and give it a memorable name. And it could be strawberries and cream. It could be whatever. But make the name of this, make the name of the section relative to the first move that you need to know. Which makes sense because actors uh, always go back to certain lines when right. they're starting over a scene or right. a, a marker on the ground. But with fights that's a completely right. different thing so that's actually really smart that makes a lot that's of sense. something that's something that you know we came up with um purely a necessity you know it evolved through necessity because you know once we got this monster of a fight which was 300 sections even you know myself and michael um he's my right hand man we work like you know batman and robin together sometimes he's batman sometimes i'm batman just depends you know what's going on that day but you know we're, he's fantastic, and the other guys, there's, there's John, there's Adam, there's you know there's some great guys that we work with in the four team. They're absolutely fabulous. But you know we were getting lost because the fight was so huge initially. You know, so when we were f first putting the fight together, first thing about like what section was that? It was the bit that did that, and then that's when I was like, well, you know what, we need to Lego block it. You know, and the nice thing about Lego block, we call it Lego blocking. That we made up all these silly names for what we do. But the reason we call it Lego blocking is because I can take that one block and fight out and put it anywhere. Oh, okay. So I can mix and match. I can take the whole fight as one piece and it runs sequentially. Right. Or let's say for some reason section number five is not working. Well, let's switch that with section number eight. Wow. So it's like, you're, yeah, it's like Legos. So you can stack them however you want or you can follow the instructions. Yep, exactly. And, and, that, and that way you're not locked into it being just one way because on and again this is something that maybe some of the younger uh stunt performers might get an idea of it's it's one thing to put a fight with you and your buddies together and you do it and it's great and it's all good and it's fabulous and everything's great and everyone does their cool moves it changes when you're on a because it's not about your cool moves it's not about what you think you can do it's not about you at all it's about what the camera sees it's about the, it's about the camera sees about what the actor wants it's about what the director wants it's got nothing to do with what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of what you want, let's get back into the family aspect because you hear actors talking about, oh, this cast became such a family, but you don't really get to hear about the directors, the producers, the, right. the, the, the writers, the, the grips, all the behind. And like we were just talking about, because my buddy Hoover said this to me back when I, we were doing my music video, you know, Casey, there's two types of people in the industry. There's in front of camera people and behind camera. You're in front of camera. Stop trying to tell me how to do my job. So yeah. those behind the camera, you know, what's that family like versus the actor type family? You know, it's all big, one big family. Honestly, it's it's there's, there's there is no separation, and that's the beautiful thing about working on Vikings. You know what I mean? It's like the, the actors on Vikings were all super down to earth, cool people, genuine friends. Like I keep in touch with a bunch of them already. You know, it's not like they're, they're, they're friends like we're friends. You know what I mean? You know, we don't see each other very often, but you're a friend or a friend of mine. We know each other. We keep know. track of each other. Yeah. With these guys, I mean, we bled together. We've been through wars together, literally like up to our necks in mud and rain and, and, the, and the you know and that's everybody you know the crew the cast the catering people everybody's like okay we've got to film up in that mountain today and the rain is howling all right let's go and that's normal you know we're in, we're in ireland you know that's the kind of thing that the weather does not does not care 
you know. Yeah. So, no, no, no. And and especially because of those extreme conditions you guys do, that makes a lot of sense where it's just, you're all under the same kind of suffering. We're all, under the, we're all doing the same thing, you know. So, you know, I've seen like even Travis and Travis on the show, Travis will be helping the grips and stuff move, move carts. I mean, everybody was just like, you know, let's just get on and get it done. Stunt people, you know, even though the, the, the camera, we let, you know, we kind of let each other do our own jobs, but if someone's stuck, you see the stunt guys jumping in and helping out. You see the camera guys jumping in and helping us. You know, it's it's it, because the thing is, is when you work with people for years, you genuinely become friends. It's not a put on. It's not like, oh, hey, bro. You know, it's not like that. It's right. like, hey, you know them. You know their family. You get to meet their family. You get to see we have dinner. You know, and it's and month after month, year after year, all of a sudden, you know, like I genuinely miss so many of the crew and the, and the cast over there. You know, it's because we became friends for so long and we, we genuinely suffered and triumphed together, you know, to make this happen. So when we see it on the screen, it's like, I remember who was eating a donut behind that tree, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Those kinds of bonds of war that, yeah, that bring you together, yeah. Remember these things, and it, and it was a fabulous experience to go from, you know, um, season two all the way through to the end of season six. It was really emotional. You know, at the end of that, you know, it really was emotional and, um, you know, it's out of the press now, so I can mention it, but there's um, a new Viking show coming up called Valhalla. Um, yes. It's a spin-off um, set a couple hundred years after Vikings finishes. Oh, awesome. New, new blood, new actors, new storyline, same mud, same rain, same blood, you know. Same, same fight back. coordinators. Uh, same stunt team, yep, we're all, we're, we've all been asked back, which is great, so Rich is coordinating again, and then it's all the same guys on the whole team, you know, so it's going to be great, so they, they wanted to, to keep it, you know, if it's not broken, why, why fix it, they wanted yeah. to keep all together, so, you know, it's the same camera department, same guys are all coming back together, so um, we're going to be starting work on that, pre-production starts in March in Ireland, same studio, uh, starts shooting in April, and then we'll go from there, but that's about all I can say about that one right now. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I understand NDAs. But you know what? It's Oscar week. And since we're talking family in front and behind the camera, let's talk sure. Oscars a little. Do you have any favorites out there that are actually nominated? Honestly, for me, I, I really hope Joaquin Phoenix just cleans it up. You know, because the Joker, the Joker for me this year was probably the, the most powerful movie I've seen. Mm -hmm. Just on the aspect of mental health. You know, mental health alone. I mean, despite the whole Joker aspect of it, just the mental health system, how it lets people down how it affects people and you know even today when you're driving around you see so people on street corners and, and sleeping under bushes who are and who are obviously needing help and they're not getting it the system's letting them down so i think the joker is a fabulous movie as it was i was a huge fan i thought king phoenix's performance was you know outstanding i mean he if i was nominated and i got an oscar and, and he was this year i'd just give it to him you know i'd like i don't, I don't deserve this this is for you because in my opinion, he, he should clean up. You know, he right. really should. I hope he does. Right, right, right. And 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 just the fact that he gave that uh, speech at the SAG Awards, talking about more inclusion in the Oscars, and the fact right. that, like, you know, uh, just there were I read articles about him saying, oh, he may have risked his chance of getting an Oscar by coming out and talking smack on the Oscars for inclusion. But like, I I I personally felt that was very brave of him. Sure. Well, I mean, th there has to be a point where. You know, people just say, look, you know, every other department has a nomination. But, other, but, but, stunts. but stunts, which is why I want to have you on an Oscar week, because I got a ton of stunt actor friends. And you know what? They're actors. They're not stunt actors. They're actors. They just happen to be very right. physical and do stunts. They deserve right. their own nomination. Well, and, and that's the thing. I think over the years, you know, the, the industry's developed and you have to, you know, when you... Like, for example, when I'm working with stunt performers who are um, in an active fight, I tell them, it's like, look, you're the hero in this fight. You don't know you're going to die because there's nothing worse. And I, I teach this. It's like, there's nothing worse. You don't want to be a Star Trek red shirt. Everybody knows the red shirt goes to the planet. He doesn't come back. Bravo. Yes. Yes. Thank you for that nerd you, reference. You don't want to be that guy because the audience knows that you're there to die. You want to be part of the Jeopardy you know, are part of the story. So I tell the stunt actors, they might only have two or three moves then die, but I'm, I, I'm like, look, for you, you're in this battle with your king, 
you're going to win, you're going to go home, you're going to see your family, you're going to eat, and you're going to drink and you'll be merry tonight. You don't know you're going to die. You just, that guy, you don't know it's a main actor. Take all that away. That's not an actor, that's your opponent. And when you have a bunch of stunt guys that have trained together so long, with actors that have trained together so long, you can make those margins and that pressure so tight and so visceral. So the idea is that actor should feel like, holy crap, I need to be close here. The actor shouldn't be comfortable. The actor should be really working hard to make it believable because that's the only thing that really matters. Do you believe the action? Part of believing the action is to help those stunt actors act. Like you were saying, they're acting. They are the hero in that story until they're not. And they don't know when that's coming as a character. They right. do as a former, but as a character, they don't. So they cannot, I call it laying up, don't lay up to get killed. Don't wait to get killed. Don't be the guy who's like, here's my punch, kill me. Here's my sword, kill me. And right. kill the actor. And obviously you keep it safe. I'm not saying kill for real, but it's through the choreography. But your intention has to be true. Your intention has to be honest. And then you, you don't die till it's, you didn't know what was coming. And that's the, that's the difference between a stunt performer who, in my opinion, really knows his craft and guys who may be a little bit newer or don't have that thought or have never thought that way who are there to make the actor look good, which you are, but you don't want to be the Star Trek red shirt. And I see a lot of Star Trek red shirts and even movies today, Star Trek red shirts everywhere. You know, right. and it's just, and it's just, it's just maybe they don't think that way, but for us on Vikings, it's a massive amount of visceral violence. And unless everybody's on the same page, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. Well, all, you, I don't all, want the actor to be too cool for school. You know, the actor can't be too cool for school. Right. They, yeah. And all but, the, all the hair and makeup in the world only makes the character. That's that's just a character design. You need the, like you're calling them stunt performers, you know, but they, like you say, there's a difference between a stunt performer and a seasoned actor who's a stunt actor. Right, right, exactly. And it's blood in those lines, you know, so that, so that, you know, the physically, you know, if that other actor, if that other stunt actor came in and did a fight and all of a sudden started having dialogue and lines, it wouldn't make you think it was weird because it, it's believable. You know, the way they move, the way they talk, that they, they are just as important as the, um, the main actor. Even though they might only be on the screen for that moment, it makes the whole thing believable. And an actor, I tell actors this, you're only, your character is only as important or as skilled as the quality of opponents that it defeats. Yeah, mm -hmm. your so, good guy is only as good as your bad guy is bad. Right, so if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're mowing through a bunch of guys and you're making it look super duper easy, you know, it's like, okay, you're, 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 kicking, you're kicking kids around, you know what I mean? You're, 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 fighting, you're a grown man fighting a bunch of five-year-olds. Doesn't make you a good fighter. Like Darth Vader at the end of Rogue One. Right, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything, you know what I mean? But if you're the character that people care about, and all of a sudden you've got a bunch of evil beasts in front of you, who are absolute monsters, and you're like, holy, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to survive this, and that comes across in the story and the character, and you come out of it and you survive, that levels you up in the audience's eyes because you just came through a massive challenge. You know, and, and that's the thing where, like, I love Superman, but the thing about Superman for me is, you know, is that all of his problems are internal. He needs a therapist, not, not you know what I mean? He's like, like <laughs> he needs therapy. You know, because there's nothing apart from kryptonite. There's nothing can harm him. So, all of his all of his angst is all in here and in here. You know, mm -hmm. he needs a box of Kleenex and a therapist. You know, um, and that's the, because whereas Batman, on the other hand, you know, he has so many issues and so much. So he needs therapy too. But at least he, he can be physical. Well, a different kind of therapy, but yes, right. kind of therapy. So, so I, you try and make your characters, you know, stunt actors, performers, or even your your main characters you know, flawed and vulnerable and challenged, you know, at least in my opinion, you know, for, for, the, for the scripts and stuff that I like to work with. Yeah, no, and you're totally right. And that's uh, one of the, that's why Batman's one of the most popular superheroes out there. And I use superhero loosely because he doesn't have any superpowers. And, but that's one of the reasons I gravitate so much to Superman and understand why he's the hardest character out there to write is because he has no vulnerabilities. His biggest vulnerability is uh, being a giant Boy Scout. Right, right, exactly. And, and, and also, and, when you watch a Superman movie, you're just like, okay, it's great, but where's where's his where's his dilemma? And it's always, you know, other people. It's always you know, for the most part, you know, and that's just what makes this character. It can be very flat for me, 
right know? right and it's the human tragedy like that's why i watch the walking dead i don't watch for zombies i watch for the human storyline to see how they get to keep their humanity and right. and i think that's why the joker was so popular is because not just not just is it a great performance and a great movie but it is that storyline based on a human understanding that maybe some of us have experienced a portion of it or we've seen someone else go through it. Right, and that was the thing that struck me about the Joker was I was sitting there and it was like, this is a, a human story and it's the tragedy of how society has let, excuse me, has let certain, you know, people with challenges slip through the cracks, you know, and, and they're just forgotten about. And then, you know, and that, that problem doesn't go away. It just shifts, you know, and it's still, it's still there and it's always gonna be there. Um, and, and so, the Joker really highlighted that, and and obviously his spiral into where he went was obviously fabulous and fantastic and wonderful the way it was done. But it was also very tragic. It was very sad, yeah. you know. It was very sad, and so you really felt for him in a way that you didn't expect to, and that was surprising. Right, which I think is a, why a lot of people actually really respond to the Joker in any level of his character. Uh, but speaking of mental health and Zen and feeling good, what do you do for your personal Zen? I mean, you work hard, you're out there doing these giant stunts and coordinations, you know, you, you're getting hurt. It's mentally and physically and emotionally exhausting. What do you do to recoup? I mean, when, I'm on, when, I'm, when we're working on Vikings, we really have very little time. So it's usually six month blocks at a time, you know, is what it's been. Um, so, you know, you basically just nut up and get through it. You know, I mean, sleep when you're doing it, you're, you know, you'll finish on a Friday, Saturday, you're pretty much comatose most of the day. Sunday it's prep day for Monday and then you're back in on Monday. So you just, you just kind of get on with it. But when I'm not working, I'll come home, you know, cause I, I live in Orange County, as you know, but I'll, I'll fly from Ireland, I'll fly home, home with the family. And I just decompress, you know, I'll just spend time with Christine, I'll spend time with the kids. Um, I play a lot of guitar, I'll read, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll start to just, you know, take care of myself, you know, as best I can. I just breathe and relax and just chill because, you know, you're under so much stress and so much pressure and everybody's pulling together, you know, to, to get it done, get it right. The schedule's coming up. It's a hard out on the 18th. We've got to be done, you know, all that stuff. You, you know, you'll take moments where, you know, during that week where you can, you, you know, you'll, you'll, you know, you take a nice long shower, you make sure you get to sleep early, you look after yourself, you eat right, all those things that you have to do, otherwise you just will not get through it, you know, and the mental health aspect is, because that is a big thing that a lot of people talk about, the stress, you know, the anxiety, you know, like you, you get on set and you've been prepping all this stuff, and I'm not just talking to me, I'm talking to the whole team, we get on set and we're looking at each other and it's like, okay, everybody's looking at us to get this right. And there's this massive sequence, you know, that, you know, Richard, the stunt coordinator, he's relying on us to get it right for him. He's, he's overseeing the whole thing. You know, he's trying to think ahead of all the things that could go wrong on the day. We're doing the same thing. We're watching each other's backs. It's very, very stressful, you know. So there's a lot of, like, you know, I never sleep, you know, the night before, you know, a big, a big sequence, you know, because my brain is always churning. It's always going over, okay, what about this, what about that? And I know the other guys are the same, you know. So when we get there, we've had very little sleep. And it's time to go. You've got the director, the producers, everyone's there. Everything's good. You've got 300 extras. You've got 50 horses. Special effects going off. It's like, okay, guys, what you got? <laughs> you guys ready? <laughs> let's, let's do this. The whole hurry up and wait. Hurry up yeah. and wait. Yeah, but it's like, yeah, and you know, we're ready. We're, I mean, despite all the stress and all the all the all the angst, um, we sure we're prepared and we're ready to go. But and once we start moving, then it's then it's boom. Then we go and it's almost like before a fight. Once that bell rings you know, you just do what you do and that's it and it goes. And then once it's all said and done, then it's, you know, uh, get to chill out for a day or so, depending on what's going on. Or not as the case may be. We may finish on a on, on a Thursday night on something, then we're we're on something fresh on a Thursday morning. So it, it like as a conveyor belt, it's like being at Walmart right. and all these this action and fight coming down the conveyor belt at you and you're just bagging it. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's rough. And now you have a couple months off before you go do Valhalla, so Yes, so I've just been spending time. I'm going to start gently, um, you know, stretching again, working out, start start getting myself prepped and ready for um, for stuff. But when we get there mid March, about three or four weeks to prep before we start we start shooting. So depending on what we're shooting first, we'll determine how manic it's going to be. It might be character development, and oh, here's this new character, you know, 
doing whatever, or it might be massive battle to start, which I'm kind of thinking it's probably going to be a massive battle to start. So yeah, why uh, not? Well, why not? You know, throws a one at deep end again. But the problem is, is, is it's a fresh cast, so we don't know anybody. Like you know, we, we don't know. We've never seen them move before, so we're going to have to have a whole training. Um, program put in place for them which um you know i'm gonna do so we're gonna we're gonna have a whole training program for them i have to assess them you know as does richard and you know we have to look at them assess them see how see what they're good at see what they're bad at and then we're going to build fight styles around their physicality as well it's another thing that i, I like to do is you know you, you don't ask a frog to be a bird you know <laughs> so yeah you know, so if someone's really good at something then you build a style around what they do and that makes you, you you play to the strengths. You find out what the strengths are, and then you you build their fight style around that. And that does two things: one, it gives them a unique look, and it also gives the, the them something. It's easier for them to learn, you know. So, so and then as time goes on, you introduce new things to them, so you give them a more complete um, sort of unique fighting style for themselves. Right. You know, right. try and have everybody have different different things that they do so that when you're watching it, if you really, really watch carefully, you'll see that this character likes to do this or there's one character that we, <laughs> Harold, if you ever watch any King Harold's fights, he's always losing his shit. Right. He's, and that's deliberate. We deliberately built that into his fights. It was like, he was, he, he'd get his sword this round, he would lose his shield, he'd be like, ah, and then, then he takes it. And, and so he was always changing weapons. Just going into end. Greco-Roman wrestling it a couple of times, even. Yeah, no, absolutely, because the, it's like he was found with nothing. It's like, okay, blah, blah, we got to go into some, some Viking MMA because, you know, MMA is not new. There's Men have been pounding each other to death for thousands of years. Yep. You know, they, yep. they're fine, but the intention's always been the same, you know. So, and Vikings had wrestling. They had wrestling. They had boxing. They had all those things. If you look back then, it, it's technically different from what is we have today, but they still had their own versions of it. You know, we did some research on that when we put together some of the action. Um, so we try and make it fun and individual for the actors. And also, if you're really watching the fights over the seasons, you'll see some, you know, the same types of things from the same actors because it's part of their character. Right. True to, to fighters, you know, fighters do like certain things. They have their favorite go-tos that they're known for. And why would it be any different when it's sword and shield or axe or whatever? Yep, you know, yep, yep. If you're, if you're a striker, you stay standing up. If you like a ground, you ground a pound. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're, you're a sword guy, you have certain things like you with a sword or an axe or axe and shield. And there's things that you were taught. And, and that's another thing I tell the actors. You learned this from your father. Your father learned it from his grandfather. And this is a family fighting style that you have. And then this fighting style, this is what you guys do. This is I what like, you guys do. I like that. Yeah. So there's a lot more, there's a lot more depth goes into getting the actors to think right than people think. It's not just here's some moves and blah, blah, blah. Right. Get into the psychology. This is your great grandfather's sword. This is your, this is your um, family history. This is the, how you guys are known to use your sword and shield. This is how you guys do this, that, and the other. And, th and you see the actors switch on. They go, oh, never thought about it like that. It's like, yeah, this takes some family pride in what you're doing because this is the, these techniques have kept your family safe for generations. Right, and right. And we're trying to instill in them. You know, and and it works because it, it gets them thinking on a different level. Um, yeah. Well, I also I also like what you said about you know you're 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 building on okay what are you good at as a fighter as an actor fighter and you're building from there you're giving them the best opportunity to win I don't know you're kind of like Coach Andy Reid taking the Chiefs to the Super Bowl you're building around their skills right and and that's the whole idea it's like it's it's like I try and avoid being in front of camera as much as possible now because, you know, I've, they keep throwing me in front of it and the, the rest of us, but the core team, we all try and hide as much as we can. But we're always in front of them. One aspect is it's, we're, we're, we're there with the strings, you know, and we're, 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 manu we're even though we're not on camera, we, you know, all of us, you know, Richard, the coordinator, and the rest of the core team, myself, we're all there with our, our fingers in the pie at all times, even though we might not even be on screen. We're there and after every cut, we're walking over, we're talking to the actors, we're bringing them on or we're showing them what's up. And as a team, as a stunt team, core team, we are constantly um, babysitting everything that's going on so that it's going to be what it's supposed to be. And, uh, you know, there's a, I work with a fantastic bunch of guys and it's, it's you know, they really are brothers. 
Yeah, and, and, the, and the workmanship shows you guys should have uh, pride. I can't wait to see what you guys do on Valhalla. Uh, but back to what you were saying about the mental health and everything, and I really like how you brought in nutrition and physicalness because as a human, we're, we're connected spiritually, emotionally, physically, it's yeah. all, and nutrition, it's all connected. And that's super important, especially for as a physical job as you do have. Right, and it's one of those things where I've, I've had, you know, where I haven't looked, I've just been crazy about looked after myself as well, simply through lack of time. I can make all the excuses in the world, I just didn't. You know, I'd be just grabbing what was there, I'd be doing what I was doing to get there. And you suffer for it, you know, you suffer for it mentally, you suffer for it physically, your angel. Good. And so, you know, you go through cycles of, okay, I really need to dial this in because if you get right, then of what you have to do is, is so much easier, you know. So it's like, it's but if you show up on set and you haven't slept and you haven't ate and you're hungry, you then the rest of the day is going to be more challenging. But if you're up early, you're ready to go. Um, you know, you've, you've, you've put the right nutrition in your system. Your gear's prepped. You're sorted. You're, you're there. You rock up and you're, when everyone else is in a shambles trying to figure this stuff out, the stunt team, all the guys do this, we're ready to go. You know, one of our guys, Adam, he's a fantastic human. He, he meditates every morning. He gets up extra early. Meditates every morning, does his thing, gets up, and he is the most zen, chill, badass you'll ever meet. He's such a super cool badass guy, but he's just like nothing. Get nothing phases him. He's like, all right, what's next? What do we need to do? He's awesome. You know what I mean? And I go to him for hugs and cuddles when I need it. <laughs> <laughs> and because it's important, you know who you can. Because like you said, you guys are family, and that's the difference between a movie set where you're together just under a year versus a television program where you guys have been together for six, seven years. Well, the thing is, is the stunt guys, you know, we, we, we rent a house together. We share a house, you know, so we're roommates. We live together. We work together. You know what I mean? We, you know, Adam and I play guitar. So we, we have a guitar room set up where we're at. So part of the mental health aspect is when we have the energy and the time, we will just come home, we'll shower, whatever, we'll grab some guitars and we'll sit for a couple hours and just play. You yeah, know? That, that's a whole nother level of love. Yeah. Right. Something that we'll do just because which, of which actually leads me to my next question because okay so recently on inside of you which is a podcast put out by michael rosenbaum he mm -hmm. was lex luther on smallville back in the day one of okay. my favorite one of my favorite shows anyway it's a very fun podcast i recommend you guys all check it out uh but recently he had Stephen amell on the show it got cut up into two different sections because Stephen Amell had a panic attack and extreme anxiety in the middle of uh, the interview uh, uh, after it started about 15 minutes in. He almost canceled on the interview and didn't even do it because he just didn't feel right. And it turned out like after eight years of doing Arrow, like he was just like so spent and just everything. Uh, but a lot of it was also the anxiety of leaving the show and missing that family combined with <laughs> the small window before his next project. Like, can you talk a little bit about that? What are you experiencing as Vikings is coming to an end? Well, you know, that, that was the thing. It's like, it's the end of an era, you know, and you know, I think everybody suffers from some form of anxiety or depression in some level, some worse than others. And, and it also depends on the cycle of your life because I mean, if you're, you know, if you're, you know, single, you've just been on a show for a long time, you've made a bunch of money, you know, your stress is going to be less than that if you're a married man with a bunch of kids, and, um, you know, you've got, uh, you know, some stunt guys that have got horses to keep, they've got this, they've got that, the next thing. And so they really need the next gig to start soon because they've got bigger expenses because the, the life's at a different, different level. Um, other guys, you know, they're workaholics, so they, they freak out because, you know, they're set financially, but the show's ended and they're like, oh, God, I've got to get another gig, I've got to get another gig, and they start freaking out. You know, other guys don't worry about it because they're cool. And like, you know, half the stunt team from Vikings took off to Bali after um, it finished. And they went to Bali for I don't know, a month or two or something and just hung out and scuba dived and just chilled out because they'd earned it, you know. I came home with the family and hung out with the family and just, you know, just decompressing and be over here. Um, so everybody's with it differently, but I think it's, it's, it's true. Everybody has a certain amount of anxiety and um, you know, suffering depression. And, and it's really important to talk about that. It's really important to, to address it. You know, even if you don't want to, if you feel you're suffering from something like that and you don't want to talk to family yet, then go see a professional, you know, go get some guidance, go find out exactly what's going on with you. Because, you know, I even know for myself personally, going through certain things in life, 
that you don't have all the answers. You know, as much as we're brought up to be tough men and we're brought up to have, you know, you know, you know, fight the good fight and slay the dragon, sometimes you need a little bit of help with that dragon because that dragon can be a bit of a beast, you know. Yeah, and, and, it's fire. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Big, ugly, scary thing. So, <laughs> so <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? So it, it just depends and, and, and it can change in an instant. It can change by day by day. Um, so I think it's important that we all try to keep a finger on the pulse of where we're at and here. And then that's the most important thing. And after that, other things can manifest and you can take care of other things after that. But if you're not right in yourself, nothing else is going to be either right or as good as it could have been because you're not firing all cylinders. You know? A hundred percent. Yeah, preach, brother. I'm bowing down to you right there. Well, then well, let's, is, let, let's, wrap, let's wrap this baby up. Like sure. you got a little bit of downtime before Valhalla. Like, is there anything you're going to read or binge watch or like, what are you going to nerd out on besides hanging out with the family? Is there anything like as an entertainer you're excited to get on real quick? Well, I mean, for, for me, it's like I, I, I always, I'm always watching um, action shows just, just out of A, for fun and B, for, you know, professional interest to see what's going on. Um, my prep for, for going to Valhalla is really going to be more personal. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to start working out again a little bit harder. I'm going to start, you know, I'm going to dust off the swords a little bit and start start playing again because I haven't touched a sword in a year. You know, I just kind of put them all away and was like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to leave that. Because, you know, you spend 10 months of the year swinging a sword. It's like, okay, put that back. So I'm looking forward to dusting those off and getting to the team again and starting to play and starting to just sharpen things up and um, see what the... Um, you know, first script is the ones on our desk. See what it involves. <laughs> Probably dragons. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully, no dragons. That's going to start yeah. off real rough. You never know. But anyway, so we'll see how it goes. But as things develop over there and uh, stuff, I'll keep in touch and uh, I'll uh, w w whenever I can reveal some stuff, um, which maybe never, I don't know. But you know, if, I'll keep in touch and let you know what I can. You know? Yeah, no, no problem. I understand. Uh, you know, I've signed enough NDAs. I've worked on enough projects that have never right. ever seen the light of day and never ever well. And I'm still not allowed to talk about them. So I get it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's been a pleasure to have you on Down the Road Show. Look forward to talking to you more about Valhalla in the near future or <laughs> probably a year from now, I guess. And uh, but anyway, it's just good catching up with you and seeing you and seeing how happy you are with the new wife and everything. Three yeah, years now. Happy, happy anniversary. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. and give her my love, by the way. I will. I'll let her know. Thank you so much. All right, Ken. All right, we'll see you down the road, brother. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you to all my guests this week. Uh, important life lessons again, once again, from Brian C. Dunn. Uh, go get the book, whether you buy it from Matthew Wool at a con near you, or go get the audibles and listen to it. You're going to love it. He's a great guy. And I'm excited for Valhalla. I can't wait to see what Lee and, and the rest of the stuff coordinators and team do with the, with, with the spinoff from Vikings. Because I've loved everything they've done with Vikings. So it has been super entertaining. So we'll see what happens. And uh, hey, may the winds of fortune take us all to Valhalla one day. Thanks for stopping in. We'll see you all down the road.